Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming to uh, this installment of the series that I've been doing here at the South Broad Council on Aging now for, I think, seven years. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us at Myrick O'Connell. There are 40 in Worcester and 20 here in Westboro. Um, we're actually the biggest firm in the area. No one's heard of that. <laughs> so there are a lot of us. By virtue of having that many lawyers, we have the ability to everybody specialize in what they do. I just do this. Uh, and I do a lot of work with my average, my median client at age, age is 74. So I do kind of nothing but this kind of work. I always love that part because most of my clients think I'm young. Cheers me up, you know. So um, I decided to do this presentation because I found that, that pretty regularly when people are talking to me, brand new folks coming in, the first, one of the first questions that they'll inevitably ask is, do I need a trust? Or they'll say, I think I need a trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? Well, because my neighbor's got a trust and they told me I have to have a trust. Or because my daughter told me that I've got to have a trust. But they're not sure exactly why. Um, and I guess the purpose of this presentation is to talk about trusts and to differentiate the different kinds um, and to talk about which trusts may be appropriate for which situations. Because the purpose of a trust, it's simply a way of solving a problem. And the trust bit changes depending on what the problem is that you're trying to solve. So I want to kind of talk about what those problems might be uh, if you are older, starting at about 65 and going until you're dead. So, so we can talk about what the problems might be and therefore what, what the solutions might be. So first, um, before we start, and we're going to talk about, use as my example, my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. You've probably seen these folks before. I always use the standard joke if you, that if you get that joke, that means you're old enough to be my client. <laughs> the young people, they kind of scratch their Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. What does that mean? So, so, uh, so you've seen these folks and the, you know that their goal, all planning aside being equal, is they want to make sure that if one of them dies, everything goes to the other, and that if they're both dead, it goes to the kids. You've probably, that's probably not an uncommon planning scenario that you've heard about. So before we start going into what their issues might be, I want to start off with a few definitions. What is an irrevocable trust versus a revocable trust? Or what is an irrevocable trust versus a revocable trust? And why do people keep using those different words? By the way, if you look it up in the dictionary, you can pronounce it revocable or revocable or irrevocable or irrevocable. Either way, it's okay. There are regular arguments among lawyers about this, but you can do it either way. So I'm just going to kind of talk about those terms. So um, if I wanted to give you something, if I wanted to give you $1,000 um, in a legally binding way, I would have to take my $1,000. One way I could do that is I could take this $1,000 and I could hand it to you. And if you take it, then that is a legally binding gift. As long as I give it to you with donative intent, that is the intention to give it to you, and I give it to you, I don't just have the idea that I might give it to you, but I really give it to you, and you receive it. So donative intent plus delivery plus receipt amounts to a legally binding gift. And the reason why that's of significance is that if I give you that $1,000 and it meets those three criteria, and then the next day I want it back, you don't have to give it to me, right? It's really yours. It became yours the moment that you received this gift, right? So that's one way that I could give you things. Another way, though, if I was a little nervous maybe about what you might do with the asset because you're young or you've got a, some kind of a, some issues, you've got creditor problems or whatever, is instead of that, I might um, create a trust. What is a trust? A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. It's not a separate legal entity like corporations are and limited liability companies. It's a relationship between two kinds of people, trustees, who are the people who have the legal ownership of the stuff that's in trust, but they're holding it not for themselves, but for the benefit of these other people, which can include themselves, but may include others, called beneficiaries. So instead of giving you that thousand dollars or the ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars or my house, uh, I might instead transfer it to the trustee of this trust. Now I don't, unless it's real estate, I actually don't have to put the terms of the trust in writing, although I usually would. Um, but but in most cases, the, the, they we put stuff in writing, and it would say in the writing, um, how the trust is, trustee is supposed to handle that property for the benefit of all those beneficiaries, right? 
But if in that document I have not said specifically that that is an irrevocable trust, then at any time, then it's revocable. And at any time, I can call the trustee and, I'll say, and can say, you know, I want that property back. I decided I don't want to do that, right? You may have distributed some stuff to the beneficiary, and that's okay. But the remaining stuff that you're holding, I want it back. Because that was an irrevocable trust, right? An irrevocable trust, as you would gather, is one where I can't do that. Where once the assets are in there, unless there's something about the, in the trust that says that I can get them back, I can't simply say I'm calling you and revoking the trust and taking it back, right? So that revocable versus irrevocable, though, is different from amendable versus unamendable. So that trust that I created and gave you some money for the benefit of these other people, maybe your kids or maybe somebody else, um, would have some rules in it regarding how the trust was going to get run, when you make the distributions, how you invest the money. But, but it may also have some sections dealing with whether or not I can amend the rules of that trust. And if I can amend the rules of that trust in order to make myself the beneficiary, right, then even though it's irrevocable, I can still get the assets back because I can amend that trust. And the reason why that's of significance, most of you, when you think about irrevocable trusts, hear, think about it in connection with uh, protecting assets for mass health purposes. Oh, I'm going to transfer it into an irrevocable trust. And then once it's in there, and it's been in there for some time, like five years, if I need a nursing home and I need to qualify for mass health, the assets aren't going to count. Well, that's only partially true. It can, if it's transferred to an irrevocable trust, but that trust gives you the ability somehow to get the money back or actually names you as a beneficiary of the trust in some circumstances. Well then, if I were later to try to qualify for mass health, those assets would still be countable because I still have the ability to get them back. So the question isn't whether the trust that you put it into is revocable or irrevocable, it's whether the, it really, the, the transfer in there really amounts to a gift. It really amounts to a, a, a situation where you can't get it back. That's the point. Okay, so that's revocable versus irrevocable, am amendable versus unamendable. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as it applies to different kinds of situations. Finally, there are testamentary trusts and there are the rest called inter vivos trust. A testamentary trust is a trust that is in your will. Your will is called your last will and testament. If you die without a will, then the rules that apply regarding your assets are called the rules of intestacy, the rules regarding somebody who didn't do a last will and testament, right? If in your will you say, as opposed to, you know, here are the people that are going to give the property to, if you say, well, regarding this one person, instead of giving it to them, I'm going to hold the assets, I'm going to say that those assets are going to get held in trust for that person's benefit, Maybe because they're little kids. That's most often when you see a standard will with a testamentary trust. It's like, what if it goes to the grandchildren and they're only 10? You know, you don't want to give them the money, so you're going to have someone manage it and trust. So that trust, which is part of the will, is called a testamentary trust. All other trusts, if they're not part of a will, are called inter vivos trust. Inter vivo, vivos, inter meaning between, and vivos, people who are living. Inter vivos trusts. So they're trusts that were created other than by will, usually while you're still alive. Because the testamentary trust, of course, only kicks in when you're dead. And, and, and may never kick in if in the meantime you change your will, because your will is never irrevocable. You can always change your will, okay? So that's just kind of some terms. So here's my friends Frank and Mary. There's their goal in life. They want to live in their house and die, until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And then they want to divide up their assets. Their estate plan is very simple. One, if one dies, it all goes to the spouse. Otherwise gets liquidated, means turned into money, and divided up into piles and going to go to the kids. So that's what they say in their will. What they also say in their will, though, but they don't really say it, is here are some people they don't want it to go to. They don't want their assets to go to the Department of Revenue or the IRS. I've yet to have a will where someone says, I really, the, what the government's done for me, I want to give them something back. You know, I want to throw in a million dollars to the IRS or even a 10000 or the nursing home, oh, I love this, these nursing homes, I really wanted to go there. Or the lawyers, or mass health, there are a set of players um, that you don't want to go, the assets to go to. So I always tell people when we're doing this kind of planning, part of the planning is to make sure the assets go to the right place, and another part is to make sure it avoids going into places where you really didn't want it to go. Okay? So with that in mind, 
Let's take my friends Frank and Mary, and this is their situation. They're 65 years old. They're some of my young clients. Um, um, there you have a house. It's worth only $300,000. They own it jointly, but there's no mortgage. See, Frank has an IRA worth $150,000. Um, Frank has an annuity that, that upon his death would pay Mary as the beneficiary. It's one of life's great ironies that the person who actually receives the annuity checks, if you go buy an annuity, isn't called the beneficiary. It's called the annuitant, the person that gets the money. The beneficiary is only the person who gets the money when the annuitant is dead, right? So that's the beneficiary. Mary's the beneficiary. And then they have some savings. And the savings are worth, what, $250,000. They own those, that, those funds jointly also. So there are their assets, $800,000. Now, they come into me and they're 65. They may, not very, they may not be especially worried about protecting these assets in the event that one of them needs nursing home care because they're so young. Uh, and because they know, or they have a, this kind of sense, that if you're 65, your chances of getting Alzheimer's, having Alzheimer's or getting it, and Alzheimer's is the leading cause of dementia, that whole set of symptoms that lead you to nursing home care because you just need help with a lot of stuff. Um, your chances of getting that are one in nine. If you're 85, your chances of getting that are one in three. So your chances keep going up over time. What, you know, why is that? Because by the time you're 85, you didn't get killed by something else, right? So you're 85, you're still standing. Because if you had cancer or diabetes, you had a stroke, chances are you're already dead. So at this point, you made it through all that, but you're going to die of something, and, and increasingly the likelihood becomes you're going to die of, of Alzheimer's. So if you're 65, though, I'm assuming Frank and Mary at this point aren't especially worried about that. So they, are, they may also be worried, though. Remember, they don't want to leave any of the money that, to that guy at the hat, right? They don't want to leave money to the IRS or the Department of Revenue or whatever. But in Massachusetts, the estate tax, the Massachusetts estate tax due when you die, uh, only kicks in if the estate is worth more than a million dollars, right? And so their estate is worth less than a million dollars. And so they don't really care about that. The federal estate tax system only kicks in if your estate is worth more than, a little more than $5.4 million. Uh, and if you're married and you don't use your exemption when you die, your spouse gets it. And so that person actually has an exemption of $10.8 million. So it just doesn't apply to uh, a lot of folks. So, so they're not especially concerned about that either. So what are they concerned about then? Why are they talking to me? Well, typically because they want to avoid probate. Because they don't want to waste money. Well, why do they want to avoid probate? Well, let's just talk about that. Once again, um, there, are, there are their assets. That's their situation. They are concerned that if things go through probate, um, there are going to be delays and it's going to cost them money. Why would anything go through probate? Well, because if you die owning something that is just in your name so that we can't figure out who gets to own it after you die, well, then that's when things go through probate because it's the, the process of figuring out who gets it is the probate process. And, and if you had a will, then you would file that will together with this petition in the probate court. And if the probate court agreed that that was really your last will and testament, not the second of the last will and testament, but the last one, and that it was signed when you were competent and that you signed it freely and that you were over 18, then the assets that you have are going to get divided up according to the terms of the will. Uh, if you don't have a will, then it's, the assets are going to get divided up according to the, 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 the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply if you, don't, if you don't have a will. Now, in this case, remember Mary's and Frank's goals were if one of them died, everything went to the other one. And if the second person died, everything went to the kids. Well, as it happens, that is exactly what the rules of intestacy say. That if you're married and you die, everything goes to your spouse. And if that person's dead, everything gets divided up among the kids. So in this case, actually, Frank and Mary don't really need a will even. Right? The rules are the rules, are going to be the exact same rules. Unless one, they were divorced or there were kids from two marriages or whatever. But in their situation, they actually don't even need a will. It's often people will tell me, well, you know, one of the, I, I'm great. I don't have to go through probate because I have a will. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The purpose of the will is to decide how the assets get divided up after you go through the probate process. This does not avoid the probate process. Okay? So, so if you die owning something in your own name, then upon your death, the assets are going to have to go through this process. And the problem with that process, from your perspective, is twofold. One, that it takes time. It least takes at least a year to go through the probate process. Why is that? Because your lawyer's lazy. No, no, no. That's not the reason. 
It's because it may, you know, it may, may, if, it's, if it takes two years, then it may be because your lawyers have got a problem. But if it takes a year, it's because your creditors, when you die, at the moment of your death, have one year from the date of your death to sue your estate to get paid. Otherwise, they're cut off. So, so, so for example, if I get into a car accident with you today, and I run you over, you don't kill you, I run you over, right? And you want to sue me for damages, you have three years from today to sue me. Otherwise, you can't. It's called the statute of limitations. If, on the other hand, I run you over and then go and hit a stone wall and die, you have one year from, that, from, my, from today to sue my estate. Otherwise, you're wiped out. So from, the pers from your perspective, that's a short statute of limitations. It shortens the statute of limitations. Of course, from the perspective of my kids, or in the case of Frank and Mary, from Peter, Paul, and Mary's perspective, um, it's a really long statute of limitations because you've got to kill a year waiting to see if these claims get filed. So if you can avoid probate, you can avoid that year. You can also avoid the time and expense involved in going through that process. Trust me, the probate system is not simple. They hate seeing laymen show up because you don't know the forms. You don't know what the procedure is. You know, they want people to be dealing with who are lawyers because it's just more efficient. And so it's a hassle for you to go through it. But if you want to avoid that hassle by having a lawyer do the work during that one year, involving doing the petition and making sure it gets filed and you get approved and you get your certificate of appointment and the assets get distributed and the creditors get taken care of and maybe you sell the house while, the, while, pro, while you're going through probate, but you have to keep the assets in right, in probate, in the pile, because the creditors might show up. All that stuff, right, it's going to cost you some legal money. It may cost you five or $10,000. So if it may be that they want to avoid those expenses. Now, what about if Frank dies? You remember their assets? There are their assets. Um, if Frank dies, leaving Mary surviving, in that case, does there need to be a probate of this estate? Raise your hand if you think there needs to be a probate. Raise your hand if you don't think there needs to be a probate. The ones that say no are correct. The reason is because the house, we know who gets the house when Frank dies. He and his wife own it jointly. The legal consequence of owning something jointly with somebody is you each own 100% of the asset. You don't own half the asset. You, own, you each own it all, subject to the fact that the other one does too. Both people own the whole thing. So when one dies, that person's interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. The IRA, Frank doesn't really own that IRA. He thinks he does. And he gets these bank statements, but the bank statement at the top always says custodian of. It's from Fidelity or the bank or whatever. It's because the bank owns the account, right? Frank has certain drawing rights on that account and has the right to name a benef death beneficiary. But as long as he's f done that form naming the death beneficiary, when he dies, that asset doesn't go through probate because we, they, because we know who gets it, the death beneficiary. Similarly with the annuity. All annuities that I have seen have death beneficiary provisions, so that as long as you fill that in, when you die, the death beneficiary is going to get it. The bank accounts, same as the house, held jointly. So when Frank dies, there's no probate. Now what about if Mary dies? They were the same assets. Uh, how many people think that in this case there has to be a probate of, the, of Mary's estate if Mary dies? Raise your hand. How many think that there does not need to be a probate? Oh, you brave souls lost that time. There needs to be a probate here. Why? Mary owns the house individually now, because Frank's dead. She owns the bank accounts individually. There's no de death beneficiaries there. So when she dies, they have to go through probate. So if Mary wants to avoid that, then probably what, what there, are, there are some things that she can do. Here are the possibilities. She could, uh, if they allowed it on her bank account, she could, name, she could put death beneficiary designations on the bank account. Some uh, banks will allow that. Um, for more than one person, most banks will only allow it if the beneficiary is one person. You need to talk to your bank about that. Or she could put the property into joint names with her kids so that they all own the house or the bank accounts. Um, and that's the easiest way to do it, right? Uh, and probably the cheapest. The only problem with that is, of course, if you own 100, the bank account as a joint owner, you own 100% of the account, which means you can go take all the money. If you're one of the kids, you can just take the money. And it means if you've got a creditor, your creditor can sue and attach all the money because you own all the money. Um, and, and if there's a house and everybody owns the property jointly and now we want to, want, Mary wants to sell the house or mortgage it, well, everybody's got to sign on, right? Because they all own it, right? So you may not want to do that. 
Uh, also regarding the house, often people will consider this option called a life estate. You've all, I bet you've all heard of that. People have transferred property to a kids or to a, or to a, a trust or whatever and retained a life estate in the property. So suppose, and what that means is that you retain total control of the property as long as you're alive, called the life estate. The moment of your death, your interest evaporates because you're dead, so your life estate's gone, leaving the people to whom you conveyed the remainder interest, the remainder of the property. Those people are actually called remainder men. You could do that right now. You could now convey to these people this so-called, this future interest in the property, an interest that kicks in when you're dead. So you could do that, and, and that is also a very relatively inexpensive way for Mary to take care of her house. There are a couple of issues, though, with that that may give you pause, and I'll give you two examples. I do a lot of work um, on Martha's Vineyard um, with clients, and, and, and so I, I had two cases from Martha's Vineyard. One was a lady from Vineyard Haven who called me, who really wanted to talk to me. I had, hadn't had her as a, as a, as a client, um, and she said she just wanted to check, you know, five or six years ago, or actually about ten years ago, she had deeded this remainder interest in her house to her one child. Nice and simple, you knew there wasn't going to be arguments among the kids. She kept a life estate. And so the five years had gone by, and so she knew, given the mass health look back period of five years, that this, that this house was going to be relatively safe for nursing home purposes. That's why she did it, right? And she also knew that upon her death, there'd be no probate. But her question to me was, what happens, my, my son just got served with divorce papers by his wife. I said, oh, you got a problem. Right? Because your son owns the remainder interest in the property. Her, at her age, the re, she was in her 80s, the remainder interest in that property was worth over 80% of the value of the property, of the value of her $800,000 house, because it's on, in Vineyard Haven, right? Not a huge house, but it's in Vineyard Haven. So uh, that value is going to be part of that divorce process, right? Second case, I had a couple who had actually grown up and, and lived in um, uh, either Roxbury or, or Dorchester, and they'd moved down to Oak Bluffs, Afro-American couple. Oak Bluffs has a very, if you've been to uh, you know, Martha's Vineyard, very, fairly large Afro-American population because historically, that's where a lot of wealthy uh, Afro-American uh, musicians and, and artists from New York City would go for the summer, kind of in the, in the early 20th century. So, a lot of folks, you know, really, that's one of the reasons Obama goes, a very, very large Afro-American population, um, especially, specifically in Oak Bluffs. So, so they had, had, you know, retired, and they moved, and they had a house in Oak Bluffs, nice house, a couple, couple blocks from the beach, very nice house. Um, and they'd been living there for 20 years, and in the meantime, they had transferred uh, remainder interest uh, in the house to their four kids. Uh, and they kept a life estate. And, uh, but now it's 20 years later, they're living on their income, which is okay, but they don't have much in savings, and they want to move back to, they want to kind of cash out and move back to Boston and be where their grandchildren are and stuff. And so they told their kids, they wanted the kids to reconvey their interest in the property to the parents so that they could sell the house, take advantage of the capital gains exemption, blah, blah, blah. And three of the four kids would do it. <laughs> But what about the other one who wouldn't? So that's why they called me. They said, well, what do we do about this one son who won't convey the interest back? And I said, well, there's nothing you can do, right? He just, he owns that interest. You can't make him convey it back. He said, you could go to court and force the, and tell, and have the court order the sale of the property and the distribution of all the money. But in that case, you don't get all the money. You know, you're in your 80s. Your life estate is worth about 20% of the value of your property, right? And they said, well, that's not good. Well, what about, you know, we this is where our, all our value is, our equity. What about if we take out a reverse mortgage? I said, you could do that, pull out some of the equity. Of course, they're all going to have to sign on that mortgage, right? Because they all have an interest in the house. And that son isn't going to sign, right? So there are problems with that. And, and, and so there are, there are issues. So it is because of a lot of those issues that Mary may consider creating a revocable and amendable trust. What she would do is she'd create a trust, she would transfer the house into the trust, probably the bank accounts too, name herself as the trustee, uh, name herself and her kids as the beneficiaries, and say that during her lifetime she has complete control, it would be right in the trust document, over what happens with the trust assets. And it's re revocable, so at any time she can just take everything back. Um, at the moment that she dies though, um, she'd name one of the kids as the successor trustees, and the trust would say, just like her will would have said, I want everything liquidated and divided among the kids. 
And that's what the trustee would do. And because the asset at her death wasn't owned by her individually, but by her as trustee, nothing would go through probate. At the moment that she died, the trust would become irrevocable and unamendable. Irrevocable because, of course, she's dead, so she can't take it back. And unamendable because that's what the trust would say, would be following her death, that nobody else can change these rules. The property would have to get liquidated and the proceeds divided up. So that's an appropriate play. That's often why people will do a revocable or an amendable trust. So now, um, the, it's, so now let's take the same situation, Frank and Mary, but look, they got richer, right? And now they've got a house worth $400,000 and they've got more cash and it's worth $550,000. So now they're talking to me because they know that for estate tax purposes, if Frank dies and leaves all the property to Mary, there's 100% marital deduction, so there'll be no estate tax. But when Mary dies with those same assets, worth $1.2 million, at her death, there will be an estate tax. And the estate tax on $1.2 million, the, on a taxable estate of $1.2 million, is $49,040, right? If her assets had been a million or less, the tax would have been zero. The marginal rate on the first dollar over a million dollars is 40%. And it stays at 40% until you get to about a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars Then it drops down to 6% for reasons I won't go into. But the bottom line is, when they talk to me, they say, well, you know, $50,000 isn't a huge amount, but it's not nothing. And if we could, we'd like to avoid this, right? Is there a way you can do that? And the answer is yes, by doing some trust stuff. By creating, we'll call this a tax avoidance, uh, estate tax avoidance trust situation. Now many of you have, if you've dealt with these issues at all, have heard of this. Uh, they're often, sometimes these are referred to as AB trusts or there's a billion name, family credit shelter trusts. All of these are meant to accomplish the same thing. What you're trying to accomplish here is to make sure that when, when either person dies, their assets are less than a million dollars and therefore not subject to estate tax. Now, if Frank dies, and instead of leaving everything to Mary, he leaves $400,000 to his kids, uh, therefore the amount in the taxable estate, which is the, only the 400,000, because the, everything else there was that 100% marital deduction, the 400,000 would be less than a million and therefore Frank wouldn't get there wouldn't be any tax on his estate. And then if Mary died the next day with the 800,000 that was left, that estate would be less than a million and the, so there'd be no tax on her estate. So when Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary, what he's basically doing is throwing away his million dollars worth of, of, of transferring that he can do tax free, right? So the way that people will typically avoid that is by having both of them create uh, either in a testamentary trust, something that's part of their will, or in a standalone trust, an inter vivos trust, which they fund before they die, um, they would create, a, Frank would create a trust for the benefit of Mary. And the trust would say, uh, it won't be more than a million dollars in the trust, right? Um, and the beneficiaries are going to be Mary and the kids, right? Um, uh, there are no early distributions required to the kids, so this money doesn't have to go to the kids, right? Mary, and Mary is the trustee. So Mary is actually going to be in control of this trust, and whatever's in there can still distribute it to herself while she's alive. But for tax purposes, as long as that the trust meets these and a few other rules, which are pretty straightforward, if Frank puts anything in there upon his death, those assets can get considered to be part of his estate, they don't go to Mary, and when Mary dies, they're not part of Mary's estate. So if, for example, in this asset situation, see the house is worth 400,000, remember? And the cash is worth 550. So if Frank says, either through an a trust that he creates while he's alive, or a testamentary trust, that the house worth $400,000 is gonna go into this trust, and Mary's gonna be the trustee, and Mary's still living in the house, right? But the trust is for the benefit of the Mary and all of the kids, but Mary doesn't have to distribute anything into the kids, right? If he does that, then his estate, his taxable estate is $400,000, which is less than a million, the value of the house, and there's no estate tax. And if Mary inherits everything else, the other $800,000, and she dies the next day, well, her estate is worth less than a million dollars, and so there's no estate tax there. But in the meantime, as a practical matter, Mary got all the assets. 
because Mary got control of all the assets. But as long as she doesn't take the assets that are in trust and transfer them into her own name individually before she dies, they don't get counted in her estate. So that's, for want of a better term, the game. That is how you minimize your estate taxation. Similarly, and so see, Mary dies and there's 800,000, there's no tax. Similarly, if Mary would have died, say Mary died first, but say that she had put that bank account, those bank accounts worth 550 into her own name, and, th and then had a will with a testamentary trust that said, I want that money to be held in trust for Frank's and these other people's benefit. The rules, Frank can be the trustee. Frank can take a distribution anytime, he doesn't have to, right? The kids are named also as beneficiaries, but Frank doesn't have to give them anything before he dies. But upon Mary's death, therefore, her estate, which, go, which is the taxable estate that goes into this trust, is worth $550,000, below a million, so there's no estate tax. If he dies two days later, the rest, the, remember it all added up to a million two, so the rest is 650, is below a million dollars, and so there's no tax there. So by, by using these kinds of trusts appropriately, Frank and Mary can eliminate the estate tax. And this works. You can eliminate the estate tax as long as your total estate of the two of you put together is less than $2 million. So that up to a million dollars of either of you could go into this trust. If your assets are worth more than that, you can still reduce the estate tax by doing this because you're reducing the taxable estate of the second person to die by a million dollars. So you're reducing the amount that's going to be subject to taxation. Now once again, there's a lot of information here, right? So if you actually kind of think, if this is one of your issues, you need to talk to your attorney about it, you need to you know, talk through it. But I just wanted you to see how these trusts, and, and, and the trusts involved, you could create these trusts, Mary and, and Frank could, before they die, and put assets into them, which they would hold as trustees. Those trusts would be revocable and amendable as long as they were both alive. As to either one, when they died, the trust would become irrevocable because the person would be dead right? And unamendable, right? Or they could simply divide up the assets between the two of them and put these trust provisions in the will. They could change their will any time while they're alive. If Frank died though and things flew in, flow into that testamentary trust, that testamentary trust is irrevocable because he's dead so he can't take it back and unamendable because wills can't be amended. Once you're dead, nobody's going to change your will on you. So that's how you avoid the estate tax. So that's two cases. Now we're going to take another one. Frank and Mary, they're back to having less money, but see, they got 20 years older. They were frugal, so they managed to keep all of their $800,000. But now they're a little worried about nursing home care. They're worried that if one of them needs nursing home care, um, there's going to be a problem. If Mary gets sick, what are we going to do, right? Or if Frank gets sick. So before I kind of talk about this section, for those of you who haven't been here before, I need to give you a quick MassHealth 101. This is how MassHealth works. MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. It is the program you would apply to if you want to have the government pay uh, your nursing home bill, basically. If you qualify for MassHealth and you're in the nursing home, you continue to pay your income, like your pension and Social Security, to the nursing home. MassHealth pays the rest. So the question is, how do you qualify? Uh, and by the way, you want to do that if you're older and you have Alzheimer's causing dementia because that means you're probably in the nursing home not needing skilled care, the kind of skilled care that Medica Medicare would pay for. And even if Medicare were paying, if you're in the nursing home for more than 100 days, Medicare stops paying. Medicare is a health insurance program. It covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So if you're there for a long time, Medicare is not paying. You're either on private pay typical private pay somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars a month now or you're on mass health about seventy five percent of all people in nursing home right, homes right now are on mass health um, so if Mary needs nursing home care and Frank and Mary are both still alive Mary can qualify for mass health almost immediately the reason for that is that while Mary can't have countable assets cash or cash equivalents of more than two thousand um, dollars and obviously they have more than that um, and she could own the house, by the way. If, Mary, if Frank were dead and Mary went to the nursing home, she'd have to spend down her cash to less than $2,000, at which point she could qualify for MassHealth. But MassHealth at that point would have put a lien on her house to make sure that following her death, when the house got sold, MassHealth got repaid. So in this situation, though, Frank and Mary are both alive. So Mary 
Well, she can only have those assets. Frank can own the home itself, as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $119,220, and most important, can have unlimited income. Unlimited income. And so what these folks would do if Mary were in the nursing home and, Frank, and, need, and Mary needed to qualify, is we would transfer all the assets to Frank, Frank would keep the house. The house has an equity of less than $828,000, so that's not an issue. Frank would take the money that is more than $119,220 and go buy an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and at 85, Frank's life expectancy is 5.84 years. No matter how sick he is, makes no difference. Right? There's a table. There's a government. It's the government. There's a table. As long as you meet the conditions in the table, that's the number. So as long as the annuity is shorter than 5.84 years and calls for monthly payments back to Frank, the purchase of that annuity in any amount, can be a 50000 can be a $1 million, is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. And remember, Frank's income doesn't count when you're figuring out whether Mary qualifies for mass health. So the day after Mary has transferred the assets to Frank, and Frank has bought this annuity. Mary qualifies for mass health. And that annuity, by the way, can say that if, if during the term of the annuity Frank dies, the kids get the assets, right? So the only issue then is, what happens if Frank dies and Mary needs nursing home care? Then, then there may be a problem. Suppose that he has died before she did any of this other stuff. Now she's now the sole owner of all of this property. Well, at that point, all of the cash, if Mary needed nursing home care, all the cash would have to get spent down to less than $2,000. The annuity would have to get cashed in. The IRA would have to get cashed out. And then Mary would qualify, but the home would still be subject to this lien, right? So that following her death, MassHealth would be able to recover whatever Mary had been paid by MassHealth. So, and remember, those are her, those are her, uh, those are her assets. So, um, what the question then is, can Frank do something to protect against this so that if he dies, Mary's still going to be safe? Well, the answer is yes. All he has to do, he has to change his will because his will right now says everything goes to Mary, right? He needs to change that will to say everything that I die owning is going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. And I'm going to name one or more of my children as the trustees of that trust. And I'm going to specify that they can use those, those funds or those assets in any way they think appropriate to help Mary. Um, but they're not going to get used to pay nursing home care. As long as the assets are in Frank's name, if all of these assets were transferred to Frank by the time of his death, and then he died and this, he had this will, then all of the assets would be safe. They would not be countable by mass health. They would not be lienable by mass health. Uh, and following Mary's death, those assets could be distributed to the kids, just like the plan, the old plan, liquidate it and transfer everything to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Now, the thing about that trust, though, um, I'm going to stay there, is that the trust that is being created needs to be part of the will. It needs to be a testamentary trust. Frank cannot do this and, and fund the trust ahead of time. He can't do a, in, a current inter vivos trust. He needs to be owning the assets when he dies, the money has to pass through a testamentary trust and therefore has to go through probate. So if Frank and Mary are concerned about protecting their assets for the benefit of the survivor of them, if one of them dies, they have to structure things this way and make sure that when the first person dies, whatever you want to protect is in that person's name so that it flows through this testamentary trust and is in trust in benefit for the surviving spouse. So you can't do this while avoiding probate. So you have to kind of choose at, that, at this point. You're 80, you know, they're 85. It's going, avoiding probate could save them maybe five or $10,000. Avoiding mass health could save them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they have to kind of decide. Um, what if Frank has died, though, and left everything to Mary already, and now Mary's trying to protect things? This is a very common. I get this all the time. People come in. The widow comes in with the kids. Oh, my husband died. And now I want to make sure things are going to be safe in the event that I go to a nursing home. And I'll say, well, you know, this would have worked a lot better about a month ago before your husband died because we could have had everything in trust for you and then everything would have been safe. But now, now Mary is stuck with the solution that you've all heard of, which is that she needs to either just give her assets away to her kids, 
which have their own, that has its own problems, or create a tr an irrevocable and unamendable trust, naming probably one of her kids as the trustees. She can't be the beneficiary of these assets because otherwise they're going to be countable if, if she needs to apply for Mass Health and she's going to have to use them. Uh, the kids can be beneficiaries and she can specify in that trust that the kids at any time can take distributions of those assets as long as the kids, you, you know, agree, the trustees agree. Um, so she can know as long as she trusts the trustees and that's the key. I always say to people, that's why they call them trusts. You've got to trust the trustee. Uh, if she trusts the trustee, she'll know that if she needs the money later on, that the kids can basically make distributions to themselves and then turn around and make gifts back to their mother or on her behalf. But you've got to trust the trustee. She cannot have control of these assets. She can't be the trustee and she can't have the ability to amend the trust. She can't have the ability to get them back. And, she's got, and once she's made those transfers into that trust, she has to wait five years. Okay? Um, finally, Remember the old example that I gave for ta estate tax purposes? You know, can we do something in order to save these assets from estate tax? And the answer was yes, if the assets were a million to, we have, if Frank dies, we say that the house goes into trust and then there's no tax, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is all, that was all great, except that remember in that trust, Mary was the trustee of that trust. So for mass health purposes, those assets are probably going to be countable. And Mary was the beneficiary of all the rest of the cash. And so if Matt, Mary needed mass health in that case, those assets were going to be countable. So the question is, could we change that so that, so that, upon, that, so that we can not only get the, benefit, the asset protection benefit if Frank dies and Mary needs nursing home care, but we can also eliminate the estate tax? And the answer is yes, except that the trust that is being created for Mary Mary can't be the trustee of that trust. It would have to be the kids. And regarding the, um, the, um, the $800,000 that was, that was the cash that was going in, the trust would need to specify, if, if they want to get the tax benefit here, the trust would need to specify that the income from that $800,000 is payable to Mary. In which case, if Mary goes to the nursing home, that income stream would also have to get paid to the nursing home. The principal in this case would still be safe though, and they would have the benefit of knowing that they had eliminated their estate tax problems. So, to briefly summarize, there are three basic reasons why people talk to me um, and, and may need a trust for probate avoidance, for estate tax minimization, or for asset protection. Some of, some of these can't be done at the same time. You can't do asset protection and at the same time avoid probate. You can't. You can do asset protection and at the same time do, and at the same time do tax minimization. You can do tax minimization and at the same time do probate avoidance, but you can't do all three. Off, and I'll just give you, to, to kind of close, oftentimes, not often, but, but on a reasonable occasion, one out of every 15 or 20 people, folks will come in who had done the, who were, when they were in their 60s, did the probate avoidance trust. To make, and they put their house in it, right? Or some, and some other stuff to make sure that if they died, there was probate avoidance. And then in their heads, they thought, oh, I've got a trust. And so now it's 20 years later and they're coming back in and they're worried about nursing home care and they think they're safe because they've got a trust. And I say, well, no, you got the wrong kind. You got the trust that was designed for probate avoidance. You don't have the trust that was designed to make sure that the assets would be safe if you needed nursing home care. At that point, they get very irritated. <laughs> But it, it, it just tell me, the, the moral of that story is that when you're doing any of this kind of planning, you ought to kind of check in with your attorney every three or four or five years to see if something has changed in your life or in the law that means that some of this stuff has to get changed. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, and by, well, excuse you. By the way, if, if you thought I was talking too fast and want to see this again, um, th this will be broadcast on Southbrook Cable, but also Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. Elder Law, Frank and Mary, and you can see this or any of the presentations that I do. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm doing another presentation in a couple months, and maybe we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>